Welcome to today's webinar, Global Agriculture in Crisis, Fighting for Land Rights, Sharing Struggles and Strategies. I am Raquel, working at Asia Euro People's Forum and participating in the Food Sovereignty and Resource Justice Cluster of the AEPF. AEPF is a network of CSOs and social movements that works across Asia and Europe on pro-people alternatives that challenge dominant economic, social, and political hegemonies. It works for ecologically just and sustainable policies, and AEPF's bi-yearly People's Forums provide an input into the official Europe-Asia Heads of States meeting. We are linked with hundreds of movements across over 40 countries in Asia and Europe. Welcome to our series of webinars addressing the different dimensions of the current crisis. I am very pleased to say that this webinar is co-organized with the Land Strategies Project of the Transnational Institute. As we described it in our invitation to all of you, we want to explore how to collaborate to defend land rights and reclaim access to land. And the land question has been at the heart of rural conflicts for centuries. This webinar hopes to bring together concrete struggles over land from different geographical and political perspectives with the aim of um, learning from struggles in Asian and European rural social movements. Uh, language interpretation into Urdu is provided and many thanks to Ferux Soleria, our interpreter. Um, Farouk, um, one of our uh, organizers also of this webinar, can you please um, invite our participants from Pakistan uh, to go to this, uh, to this room where we are having the Urdu interpretation. Farouk? Okay. Thank you, Raquel. Tamam uh, doston ko welcome. यहां जो नीचे लाइन आ रही है उसमें इंटरप्रिटेशन का एक साइन है बिल्कुल एंड पे उसको क्लिक करेंगे तो उसमें दो साइन सामने आ जाएंगे एक इंग्लिश का एक चाइनीज का अगर आप चाइनीज को क्लिक करेंगे तो उर्दू ट्रांसलेशन शुरू हो जाएगी फारूक सलेरिया डायरेक्ट जब हम बात कर रहे होंगे इंग्लिश में तो वो उर्दू में बात करेंगे और फिर अगर आप चाइनीज पे क्लिक करेंगे तो आप उर्दू को सुन सकेंगे तकरीरों का ترجمہ پورے طریقے کے ساتھ تو جو اردو میں سننا چاہتا ہے اس کے لیے اپشن ہے کہ وہ انٹرپریٹیشن میں جا کے چائنیز پہ کلک کرے تھینک یو راکے تھینک یو فاروق سو فاروق جس سیڈ یو کین سلیکٹ اردو انٹرپریٹیشن اینڈ یو جس کلک آن دی تھری ڈاٹس ٹو کلک آن چائنیز uh, because we do not have the Urdu uh, title in the in the translations, in the interpretations. Okay, so we will start today by hearing from our speakers in a round of interventions. My co-facilitator, Felix Andel from ASEAN House, will post some of the questions that you are, uh, that you will be typing in the Q&A box, Q&A section for our speakers. Uh, throughout the session, we will be sharing links to resources and further readings in the chat box, and we can also engage there. But please do remember to share all questions for the panelists in the Q&A section. And if you're on Twitter or on other social media, we are using the hashtag, uh, hashtag AEPF webinars. Uh, with no space, AAPF webinar. So please do feel free to share thoughts and your reflections there. Uh, unfortunately, due to time constraints, we may not be able to respond to all of your questions, but we welcome your engagement and also consider your questions when developing future topics and events. With that said, I won't take any more of your time, but would like to go straight to introducing our excellent panelists. I will introduce each speaker as we go along. And we start today with Kukuju, who is from Transnational Institute in Myanmar. 
Kukuju is a land rights activist and an activist researcher. She has dedicated most of her time to the work with Land in Our Hands Network, which is an initiative of small scale farmers and local farmer organizations that work for land tenure rights of small scale, scale farmers and fisher folk, and particularly for women and ethnic communities. Currently, Kukuju is working with Transnational Institute on Ethnic Conflicts and the Rights to Land and Natural Resources Program in Myanmar. Uh, Kukuju has co-authored the report, Meaning of Land in Myanmar, published by the Transnational Institute. I would just like to uh, add uh, or repeat, uh, um, if I've said it earlier already, that this webinar, we are pleased to say, is co-organized by the land uh, land Strategies Project of the Transnational Institute. So, Kukuju, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, let me share the screen. Just a second. Yeah. Okay. So, for the for my presentations, I just would like to share six points, six key points. So the first one is in uh, in Myanmar. As uh, my daughter, you know that uh, we have a diverse geographical ecological landscapes and also many diverse ethnic groups. And for decades and until now. Uh, indigenous ethnic uh, communities, uh, they are practicing, uh, they're continuing on with their customary land and resource management uh, practices based on their diverse cultural belief and identity. So even though now in the country there are ceasefires agreement in some areas since 2011, there are state ethnic armed conflict and civil war and militarization on the ground is continuing. So the second point is, uh, start from uh, 2011. Uh, so actually, Myanmar has been military dictatorship for decades, and then since 2011, there is political uh, transitions. So this meant uh, the election has just finished, and has then an NLD government won again uh, in general. So. One of the government main agenda is economic development since 2011 and open for national and international investors for the various uh, projects. And then the third point is current peace process. So in Myanmar, we have uh, 20 different, around more than 20 different M group in the country. So if we group in like NCA, so National Ceasefire Agreement who has signed 10 group and then bilateral ceasefire group and non ceasefire group. So uh, within this, like uh, the NCA has a peace process, has a five setters negotiation. So including land and environmental is one setter. That the problem, but there is a same problem with existing country um, 2008 constitution and existing landlords because the negotiation seemed deadlock. So, the fourth point is, uh, whenever on the surface in the country, that's changing, uh, seem like changing, there are also on the ground land grabbing is continuing. So for example, land in our hand networks, which I have worked uh, together, uh, used to work with, and then they, we released the uh, state, uh, the research report in 2015 December, so about the land grabbings, and then you can see the details online. And then there is a difference, uh, the patterns of land grabbings are very, but have not changed over decades, and then stay happening on the ground. And then most of the confiscation directly involved uh, either the military alone or the military in combination with other actors, including local authorities, government ministry and departments and domestic business elites and company, and then now more international actors are involved. Unfortunately. <laughs> and then almost like a 
all like uh, confiscation cases happen in Myanmar are ongoing and have not been resolved in a way that provi provide justice and closure for the farmers. So the problem has simply accumulated and expanded over time until now. So the fifth point is like uh, in the current situations, all investment and development projects have to use massive land on the ground to implement the different kind of the projects. And then we have like internet displaced persons, thousands of internet di displaced persons and refugee because of civil war. And then what about their land? So we don't, we don't have a existing land policy and law, land rate law, there's no fully recognition of IDP and refugee and smallholder farmers and also land workers right to land. So, and, and then mostly like country, like land, uh, customary land rights are also not effectively and meaningfully recognized. So uh, in, like, in short, like current existing land related law policy regulation are simply, like, unfortunately, that like pro-business, like more prioritized to the business rather than the people center land policy and law. So we can see the different codes on the screen, but I will not go detail on that. And then the last point that nonetheless, so we have a difference, uh, uh, the continuing happening, the land confiscation happening on the ground. And then there are many opera situation. Nonetheless, the community and CSO are responding and also try to build a movement on the ground and using different strategy, even though there are many challenges. Uh, for example, like a legal, you know, obstacle barriers to the movement and actions. And for example, like land in our hand networks that uh, which is found in 2014 as a national platform and various different actors walk on land right issues will be involved to become like to have a more strong voice on the national level in order to claim their right to land. So it's also the multi-ethnic network and then they mainly advocated for having a federal land policy and law in the country. So uh, there's some photo that like we can see like they're using the different strategy. And then um, I would say that uh, in the trying to engage with every level of government, parliament, political party, ethnic and group on the table also, on the ground also the farmers and the group, uh, the community groups are resisting the land grabbing uh, by like making demonstrating and protests and then like uh, support and also uh, soliciting support for statements of solidarity and denying compensation offer, refraining from negotiation, etc. So it is on the ground. So like on, on the table discussion and also yeah, like on ground resistance things happening. So this is, for example, this is also the recent like campaign that we did uh, that on the vacant fellow virgin land amendment law, which is last year happened and we have a big impact to community. So the slogan of community that they are, they are, they are campaigning is there is no vacant fellow land in our community. So, uh, so to conclude, um, in this new and evolving transitional contest in Myanmar, it is very vital to have a real change for working class and rural community and fulfill their human rights and social justice. On the other hand, effectiveness changing and transition in the country cannot happen without people power and their improvement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kukuju. From Asia, we now go to uh, Europe and uh, we'll be having Priscilla Kleist joining us from the UK. Priscilla is Associate in Food Sovereignty, Human Rights and Resilience at the Center for Agroecology, Water and Resilience of Coventry University in the UK. She received her PhD in Political and Social Sciences from the University of Louvain in 2013 and worked as Special Advisor to 
Olivier de Schutter, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food from 2008 to 2014. Her research areas include the right to food and food sovereignty, agrarian movements, global food governance, and human rights. She has published Human Rights and the Food Sovereignty Movement, Reclaiming Control. She has supported the process of negotiation of a UN declaration on the rights of peasants and other people working in rural areas. So thank you for joining us, Priscilla, um, please. Thank you, Raquel, and thank you, Felix. Uh, Felix, did you uh, get my PowerPoint to share? Will you be doing that? Okay, thank you so much. It should be uh, uploaded now. Okay, wonderful. Okay, wonderful. So I'd like to start by uh, thanking the organizers of this event. I'm really thrilled to be here. And uh, I would also thank all our listeners because they are showing their commitment to uh, social justice today by, by joining in this collective uh, learning space. Uh, so in this short presentation, I will indeed uh, focus on the right to land as a new international human right. And as Raquel mentioned, I have as scholar activist uh, actively supported the process of negotiation of a UN declaration on the rights of peasants. Uh, Felix, you can move forward. Thank you. Um, so the right to land has now been recognized as a international human rights. Uh, and in my opinion, this is a major social movement victory. And it was probably the main demand of the peasant organizations and the other agrarian movements that were engaged in the negotiation of this new uh, international instrument. And I want to highlight here that uh, although it was demanded by uh, agrarian constituencies from all continents, the process in initiated in Indonesia in the late 90s um, with peasant organizations there. Um, thank you, Felix, you can move. Yeah, so I just want to highlight six uh, key achievements or key um, yeah, elements of the right to land that I think uh, are useful and that we can mobilize in our struggles. The first is that the right to land is now recognized as a standalone uh, human right. It used to be implicitly recognized as part of the right to food or the right to housing, for example. Uh, second, I would like to highlight that the collective dimension of the right to land is now explicitly recognized. So recognizing that land is communally owned and communally managed. And so there is not only the individual property uh, rights over land that are recognized. The third important element is that customary tenure is, is now recognized. So what we often hear uh, described as informal tenure or customary rights. Uh, and this builds on uh, also recognition of customary tenure in the voluntary guidelines on the governance of tenure, fisheries and forests that were adopted at the Committee on World Food Security in 2012. Another important tool, I think, in our struggles. Uh, fourth is also explicit recognition in the definition of the rights holders of this instrument is peasants' connection to the land. So their uh, dependency on the, on, on the one hand, but also their attachment. Fifth is recognition of the social function of the land. And here there's a direct link to state uh, obligations to redistribute land. So whenever there is too much concentration of land, uh, governments have an obligation to um, undertake agrarian reform programs. And I think this is also key uh, in our struggles. And finally, states have an obligation to ensure that land is used sustainably. And agroecology here is mentioned explicitly in the declaration. And I think it's important to link um, who owns the land and who uses the land to what is done with this land and how it is being used and managed. Yeah, Felix, if you can move forward. Yeah, uh, I will not have time to get into this, but I really encourage you to have a look at the text of the declaration. So the right to land is described in Article 17. And there you will see uh, the key elements uh, of the right to land, as I said, as an individual and collective right with specific recognition of uh, land tenure rights, including customary lands, uh, but also recognition of the right to return uh, for communities who have been displaced, uh, and also the right to be protected from eviction, which is uh, also number one uh, priority in our struggles um, for, for the protection of the right to land. 
And uh, as always, uh, in a human rights approach for every right, you have state's obligations. And here, for example, as I mentioned, uh, obligations of states to conduct a ground reform uh, is, is prevalent. And for all this reason, and this is maybe one, my, one of my uh, main contributions today, uh, I really prefer using the term right to land. And I see that it was done as well by Kukuju just before me. Uh, which I think is a much stronger tool for our struggle than the term land rights. And maybe I just want to open this for discussion. Um, yeah, next slide. Yeah. Uh, however, I just want to highlight also some areas which I think uh, need a bit more uh, of our attention and, and collective uh, efforts. Uh, and this is based on research that I did with Joanna Burk Martignoni. Um, we basically assessed to what extent the declaration really is progressive in terms of gender equality and non-discrimination. Uh, of course, these two principles are the heart of the declaration, which is a human rights instrument and uh, um, gender equality is, is fully part of the declaration. However, we identified a number of areas uh, where we feel like the declaration could be progressive, uh, could be a bit more progressive. Uh, Felix, if you can move forward. Yeah, uh, as you see, we identified a long list of demands that came out from uh, peasant movements and other rural constituencies, fisher folk, indigenous peoples, pastoralist organizations. Uh, and these demands uh, sadly uh, didn't make it to the, to the final text. Uh, and the number one, I think that I would like to highlight here is women's rights to inherit land. Um, and I think this is um, really a struggle for the years to come. Uh, other aspects that I would like to highlight uh, is the fact that patriarchy as a source of structural oppression uh, is not mentioned explicitly in the declaration and neither are feminist uh, or eco-feminist principles. And here I wanna highlight that um, during the negotiation process, there were quite a lot of references made by activists around the need to recognize that the same processes uh, exploit women and exploit nature. And that in order to um, address these, these challenges, uh, we need to really look at these two issues uh, in articulation. Um, another issue that I would like to mention in closing is the issue of gender identity and sexual orientation, which uh, in the end did not make it, <clears throat> sorry, um, uh, in the document as grounds for discrimination being explicitly recognized. And again, I think these are areas that we should all work on uh, more in the future. Thank you. Okay, you're muted. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you, Felix. And thank you, Priscilla, and, and um, for keeping to the time. And uh, now joining us today from Russia, Rodion Sulansiga, uh, I hope I pronounce it well, is an Udege. Udege or forest people, one of the small numbered indigenous peoples from the Eastern Siberian community of the Russian Federation. Rodion is a founder and the director since 2000 of the Center for Support of Indigenous Peoples of the North Russian Indigenous Training Center, uh, which holds a UN special consultative status with ECOSOC. He also uh, represents Rai Pond in the Arctic Council and served as chair of the board of the Arctic Council Indigenous Peoples um, Secretariat. Since 2019, Rodion is a member of the UN Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and a deputy co-chair of the Facilitation Working Group of the Local Communities an Indigenous Peoples Platform on Climate Change under the UNFCCC. He has a PhD in Social Science. So, Radian, your intervention, please. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> hello and uh, good afternoon from my uh, area. Good evening to all participants. Uh, and thank you, 
Madam Chairperson and the organizers for bringing us together to exchange uh, our views, ideas, and also prospects. Uh, my mission today is to, to provide uh, indigenous people prospect from their land rights uh, um, issue. And first, I would like just to share my uh, my screen. Just to, in order, um, just to show you the Russian Federation. It's, it's it's the biggest country in the world, with different landscape and but also with different cultures. Uh, and um, it's a great pleasure because uh, the agenda today is uh, fundamental for indigenous people's uh, development and from indigenous people's prospect because the indigenous livelihood uh, are inseparable from the lands and resources, which form a basis for the traditional activities such as hunting, fishing, gathering, and nomadies. And many indigenous communities see themselves as part of the land they have reside for the centuries. And the loss of the land would thus mean the threat to their entire culture, identity, and self-determination. Indigenous communities occupy about half of the world lands. Yet, while they occupy more than half of the world land, government only recognize indigenous legal ownership of the 10% of these world lands. And survival of indigenous people depends heavily on their rights to the traditional environment, land, and resources. And restricting the industrial development, rapid advancement of effective industry to these areas, and their wildlife would run cultural security to these groups. Importantly to say, indigenous peoples are the frontline defense for the Earth's future defending the planet has never been more fatal for them. In 2019, for instance, way by the global reporting, that 40% of the land and environment defenders who lost their lives belong to indigenous human rights defenders and land rights defenders. Therefore, it must not be forgotten that aside from natural causes, deforestation and de environmentalism have other multiple routes, including uncontrolled exploitation of natural resources, unjust laws, and policies. And in, in hopes to change the situation, ironically, I would like to say ironically, indigenous peoples address political, economic, and legal system that are not of their own making. They are forced to participate in structures and procedure designed, constructed, and executed by governments who continue to act as the guardians to a group of people they have reduced in number, name, and spirit. Due to the specific developments, approaching Russia case is not an easy task, even for us living in this country. Following its own logic, the trajectory of Russian indigenous disempowerment represents a divine case. Indigenous peoples in Russia, if you look at this uh, map. Rodian, could you make it on full screen, please? Um. Let me try again. I think you need to press the display button. Yeah, exactly. Great. Thank you. I'm not sure uh, because, yeah, something wrong. With me. It just worked a minute ago, but it, if it's too complicated, we'll just leave it at that. OK. So um, 
we as indigenous peoples of the Russian North Siberian forest, we are legally recognized by the Russian government, by the Russian constitution. We covered two thirds of the whole Russian territory, living in a very remote areas with a very poor infrastructure. And of course, as many indigenous peoples of the world, we are facing with different kinds of challenges. The first one, of course, is a legal challenge. In Russia, land rights issue largely remain unresolved. Russian land legislation has continued to assign rights and allocate forest and land resources in ways that excluded or marginalized indigenous peoples. None of the three framework laws we are having in Russia containing some provision regarding indigenous land rights has proven to work. Neither land tenure is secured, no resource rights. Environmental challenges. Because of uh, coupled with the legal challenges, indigenous communities are already feeding climate impacts, such as change seasonal patterns, shortage in reindeer pastures, and change migration, migrations of species. But the key threat and key challenge for us is the extractive industry. Development of natural resources in one of the priorities of the Russian Federation economic policy in the 21st century. And after centuries of being suppressed and practically written of the history of the Russian state, indigenous peoples of Russia continue to struggle with resource infringement and with the fallout of the current and past indigenous policy failure. And in conclusion, the North and Siberia must no longer be marginalized and treated as a resource colony. A new approach is needed, one that is based on the new vision and way of thinking, an ecosystem approach in which humans must integrate themselves in the severe but fragile nature of the Arctic. The Arctic main resource of whales is not oil and gas, and gas only, but people. And in order to preserve the North, we must invest in human potential, in science, research, new knowledge, technology, green economics, risk management, and developing environmental and Aboriginal law. Notwithstanding struggles and limited numbers, indigenous peoples do have a significant role to play globally. And in my opinion, change in, in is inevitable. Progress is inevitable. Being a story of successful colonization on the one hand, it is also a story that celebrates survival of indigenous peoples and proves they can only go forward. And finally, Madam Chair, yet looking ahead, to a post-pandemic world, number one priority for all national governments will be economic recovery. But based on the previous experience, while trying to kickstart the economy, the government may choose to ignore already modest provision on sustainability, biodiversity and green economy, and target indigenous people's land and resource in instead, and once again, we will witness a race for the fast economic gain at the cost of people and nature. Thank you. Thank you, Attila. Okay, from the Russian Federation, we now go to uh, our next speaker, Attila Such, joining us from Romania. Attila, is Land Rights Program Manager of Eco Ruralis, working in support of peasant farming in Romania. In support of uh, this, um, he, since a few years ago, together with his wife, set up a small family farm rooted in the, on the principles of peasant agroecology. Currently, he is producing regional peasant varieties of plums and looking into diversifying the farm by accessing land for the raising of animals. 
besides holding a bachelor's degree in environmental engineering and a master's degree in agroecological plant protection, he also gathered extensive knowledge in issues around Romanian rural development, farmland management, and the impact of the European Union's common agricultural policy over the Romanian rural society and landscape. So Attila, thank you for being with us today and let us hear your intervention. Thank you, Raquel, a lot. And um, thank you for the good presentation. Uh, I will share my screen so that uh, it's easier to follow. Uh, just a second. Yes, I hope everybody's seeing my screen. All right, so um, just, uh, I'm, I'm very glad to participate and thank you for the invitation. I'm glad, very glad to present, um, uh, to jump from, from the Asian context to the European context, especially onto the Eastern European context a little bit. And I would like to present some tools that we are using in uh, fighting for a right to land in, in Eastern Europe, in Romania, but also in the EU. Uh, as you, you probably know, it's a very hard context to fight for land uh, because everything uh, is very settled historically in the EU and also because of the very uh, changing context of the Eastern European political landscape. So uh, just a little bit about our organization. We are established in 2009 and currently Ecoruralis brings together 14,000 peasant farmers uh, from all over Romania and we promote the vision of food sovereignty and agri peasant agroecology. And we advocate for our rights as peasants, uh, both on a national and international level. Besides developing uh, uh, several political activities, uh, so we developed various programs on the right to seed, on the right to land, but also more transversal programs about uh, rural feminism and empowering uh, rural youth. Now, just to come to the right to land program, which I am uh, uh, currently managing, uh, its objectives in the beginning were to create transparency over, over land rights and, and, and the abuse of land rights in Romania, also to connect different local grassroots struggles of peasants in Romania, but also to involve uh, into the national and European political uh, uh, policymaking agenda and to offer our grassroots policy analysis. And thus we are members of the La Via Campesina and the European Coordination Via Campesina, the international global peasant movement. But also we are part of European networks like the European Access to Land Network and the Nielemi Europe and Central Asian Network. So just to showcase a few of our, our transparency documents that we created uh, during the uh, last 10 years and we were involved in, in creating of several reports. But what we realized is that uh, land grabbing is very much real in Eastern Europe and Romania because of the, the past, because of the criminalization of peasants during the, the communist times. And after that, because of the post-communist land privatization and the failing of the national land management agenda that happened in the 90s. And also land re redistribution was veiled in a lot of corruption. And this is even happening right now. And that's the result that in Romania, we have this dual agricultural system where half uh, of the agricultural land, roughly 7 million is in the hands of peasants and the other half is in, in the hands of agro-industry and it's up for speculation. And we have a, a huge problems with land concentration and land grabbing and these are institutional problems also because of the land consolidation political agendas, but also we have a lot of lack of transparency and we also have uh, and escalated a lot of investments from non-farming entities like banks, like Dutch banks or, or, or hedge funds or, or investment funds that are buying land for speculation or industrial mega projects. And thus we reached that quantifiably 4 million hectares of land, agricultural land is already grabbed. So we should not neglect and we are not neglecting the, the effects of the European policies, the EU policies, because the common agricultural policy through its direct payment system on, on surfaces has been a big supporter uh, of, of, of land concentration like this. And also because the EU ha lacks like an overarching vision over farmland tenure, this also doesn't really help the situation. EU, although uh, pioneered at one moment the development of tenure rights tools. Uh, it still didn't, didn't implement the, the tenure, the United uh, the, um, the CFS tenure uh, guidelines, and we are still in the same uh, hat as other countries and other regions, not respecting tenure rights, especially customary rights of peasants. So um, just to to 
close with the, the problem of, of land rights in Romania. In 2014, as part of the EU, Romania had to open with, with this land market. So now we have a, a free land market, open land market uh, in, in towards the EU, which generated also a lot of capital investment into land. I would just like to showcase two pictures from my region. One of them is my house and uh, very proud to live here, very proud to see this diverse net, uh, landscape. And we should not forget that in Romania, we have places that look like this and also places that look like this. And it's very easy, uh, unfortunately, uh, due to the lack of, of land rights and respecting of land rights in Romania, to transform the landscape radically uh, through big investment and also through the lack of, uh, through the problem of, of local corruption. Um, so because of this, uh, we, have be, we have been joining hands uh, in a European network and uh, through, uh, through a European project, uh, as, uh, as you were mentioning Raquel, the, the Erasmus Plus uh, partnership land strategies, we have been, de have been developing uh, a toolkit, let's say a handbook, uh, which um, brings together different uh, grassroots mobilizations on how to safeguard our land rights, but also how to uh, promote strategies from the ground and what have we have been doing in the EU as grassroots movements to, to, um, to safeguard our land. And um, just to say that, uh, why, the, why is this handbook? Because also in the European rural landscape, there's an extreme reduction of the number of farmers. Actually, it's quite drastic. And the concentration of land is very high by coupled with the aging population and also a lot of volatile land prices, uh, there is a huge problem of uh, land being treated as a commodity. And for us as a group and for us as peasants, land is not a commodity, it's a natural resource, it's, it's a territory, it's a basis of our food production. So of course it's, it's, it's a fundamental human right as has been said. So um, we wanted to, to mark out and to put uh, hope out uh, uh, in, in the world to say that there's a lot of uh, resistance going on in, in Europe by, uh, and we, we are using a lot of strategies to safeguard our land. And thus the handbook um, is, is presenting all these strategies through different chapters and different approaches. I will not highlight all of them, but just to say that we have, uh, uh, and you can download, and I gave a, give a link in the end of my presentation, you can download the handbook, and we are giving out a lot of valuable information on how to put land on a political agenda and examples on how uh, organizations are doing this, how to defend public interests, how to uh, use international legal tools like the tenure guidelines also, but also how to um, struggle for the best use of public land in different countries, European countries. And these could be examples also for non-EU countries and also how to put land uh, for agroecology and not for our agroindustry, but also how to increase our capacity as, as uh, movements to, to, um, to be resilient, uh, to create resiliency of, of land movements. So to finish off my short and condensed and, and rapid presentation, and I'm sorry that I speak so fast, is, um, I want to give three examples, for instance, how we from Romania have contributed to this handbook, to what kind of strategies we highlighted. So while creating transparency, we have been working together with uh, journalists to, to expose, for instance, Rabobank, a huge Dutch bank that had, had uh, allegedly bought uh, a lot of land in, uh, in Romania, uh, also using local corruption as one of their, their tools. And also in, in Romania, as a Rurales, we are uh, using the tenure guidelines in order to, um, to analyze land policy in Romania, but also in the EU to propose innovative land policy, to amend existing laws and to secure the, right, the tenure rights of, of peasant farmers. And lastly, I would just like to mention as the small little picture also shows that in Romania, resistance has spurred for one of the largest open cast gold mines that uh, was proposed in, in Europe. And that is the Roscia Montana case, which is a beautiful area that wanted to be explored. The, the investors wanted to be eradicated so that it can leave way for an open pit gold mine, a lot of cyanide by treating the, the ore. So there was a huge national resistance and also international resistance. And all of this is briefly documented also in, in the handbook. And you can read about uh, how people organized and what kind of strategical levers they used to have success and indeed until now we have success. So you can get the handbook also on the link uh, uh, that, I, that I attached and I'm very open to answer all the questions and I'm really sorry that I had to condense everything in such a short time. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Attila. And um, well, they are very brief interventions uh, of all the speakers, but very substantial, I, I will say. Um, our next speaker is from Cambodia, um, Sen Reasai is executive director of Silaka organization, working to ensure the voices of women and the marginalized are being heard and counted in democratic space, especially those without access to resources and opportunities. Of course, resources would include, of course, the land uh, resources. Reasai is also chair of the committee to promote women in politics, um, CPWP, consisting of different NGOs working to promote women's rights, representation and participation in politics, public affairs, and even elections in Cambodia. She also serves in the Regional Council of the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development. She has led many campaigns, marches, and interface dialogues with policymakers, both at national and regional level to demand for amendments to the election law and other policies which are not gender sensitive. So Riasai, let us hear from your struggles in Cambodia and please speak closer to the to, to your audio equipment so that the, the sound is um, is louder and okay. Thank you. Riasai. Good evening from Cambodia. Uh, this is Riasai from Selaka. And thanks a lot for Raquel and, and the co-facilitator and also the um, AEPF organizer for inviting me and also um, um, allowing me to take a part of this um, critical discussions on the land rights. Um, just, just to let you know that even Silaka are not working directly with the uh, land activists, but through our engagement and partnership with other organizations, we try to looking at the perspective from the uh, women rights perspective. And of course, hearing from our speaker, um, talking about how patriarchy system um, um, reinforced the um, land, uh, um, you know, reinforce the system of a new economics model. I think um, on land rights um, or uh, I mean, on land issues, it's not an individual country uh, a problem, as we haven't seen from Asia, Europe, and you know, from other panelists. Uh, it become a, a commonality issue um, that happening around the regions. I don't know. Is that something that they learn from each other? I don't know that it's something that they feel it is a good model, you know, to exploit their own citizens or or something. I don't know, or perhaps who is who is um we need to question back who is this agenda. Um, I try to imagine in last ten year, um, when when during the um uh, every seasons in Cambodia we have different fruit, you know, um we can enjoy different kind of. Um, sometimes it's it um, tamarind, you know, cassava, durian, and, and so on and so forth. And and people never put a sign of um, um, right now. We saw people put in a sign. There's no chemical. We ensure that it 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 completely natural. I question back to myself. What's going on? What happenings? In last ten years, I never I never saw people um, putting the sign when they're selling the fruit because we all know that it's coming from the farm, it's coming from the farmer, there's no uh, chemical fertilizer, you know, so on and so forth. But, but what what happening on that? And then looking at that food system, um, how farmer uh, uh, have the access and control over the resource of their land, that is the connection between food system and the lands. And, and with that connections, I can see that, um, there is, there is a um, um, an events uh, an intentions of introducing of privatizations, um, the land, the social services, and other um, by promoting new economic model. Um, the panelists from Myanmar also saying that the agenda of the government of the, the Myanmar also try to uh, promote economic uh, development. 
it's, it's not much different from Cambodia right now. They're also looking at economic uh, developments and uh, promote foreign direct investment, try to make sure that uh, the, the business environment are friendly for them. Um, but and then that's coming to the question that I always raise uh, uh, from time to time is, um, is that the development for the people or people have been used for the developments? So, um, and, and during the process of that, um, economic land concession become its uh, another uh, models of the developments. And there's many different layer of the conflicts because of economic land concession. Um, the, um, for those who are owned or granted the license from the government, um, they doing more than more than it should be. For example, like a hundred thousand of hectare. For example, uh, they do more than that. They don't uh, keep their agreement based on what they have been agree. So um, I I think this this it to me it seemed like a cycle, a cycle that. Um, firstly, we see that many farmer. If, if you're looking at I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go back uh, who is Cambodia you know you can Google and then and who we are but we have been seen as a Greek culture uh, um, um, country you know 80% uh, um, of our population are, are farmer um, but up until now the statistics have been changed because um, the introducing of labor oriented through uh, the new economics model, we somehow a farmer become a labor in their own rice field in their own lands um and then there, there's there are many things uh, regarding to that um because there is an introducing that you, you should go for uh industrial life i i'm saying that it doesn't mean it doesn't industrial it doesn't it's not good something but the problem is that the message that coming out is about labor oriented and and because of that labor oriented and because of the economic land concession because of the land wrapping and other it forced people to be migrated and and without land you cannot raise your your farming you know without land how can can, can you so why because your land, you're doing the farming and so on and so forth. So um, you need to migrate to earn more income. And when you need to migrate, um, some there is a lacking of, of labor uh, in, in the country that doing the, the, the agricultural work. Uh, people might say, no, we are in a modern country. We're using a modern technology. You know, we, we have a machine, you know, to replace a human being. Um, but heavy question, is that something that we really want? Um, the story that I have been from a woman farmer um, saying that they, they, their farm are now getting more rice than before. But at the end of the year, when they calculate the cost, they are in debt more than before. Why? Because of the spending on the cost of, of doing uh, this, the cycle of, of the rice field, spending on the chemical fertilizer, spending on um uh the company asking them you know you need to plan uh, a seed based on their standard you need to buy those those seed from the company um you need to buy those fertilizer from the company and then so on and so forth so they end up in that and in co coincident with the covid 19 they put them more vulnerable and also not be able to pay in the debt so just just want to highlight how how the land uh, issue i i don't think that it it different from other country, but it's just in different picture. Um, but again, um, just want to add up something that we 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 forgot in the struggle of the movements as a land right activist, especially on women human rights defenders as a woman right activist. Um, the traumatization as a woman right activist that that um, have been denied, and also in addition to patriarchy system, in the context of of um, conservative. Uh, culture and somehow um, introducing the inequality of power between within the family community and also with the society that put women are more burden and also less power to be claimed. And, and I introduced that traumatization because I think 
um, many women right activists um, um, facing this difficulty when they go back back home they still hold that expectation from the society and somehow they decided to to um, give up their their activists somehow they decided to not to join the movement somehow they need to think about their, their family more than what they are claiming for their right. And that I'm not really introducing because uh, many movements saw that that is a problem issue, that is the family issues. And that is not um, um, you know, a movement issue, but personal is political. You, know, you cannot deny the fact that the, the, the women activists who are joining your movement right now, see getting a violent and gender-based violence in, in her own life, but it's not really addressed. Um, and also another thing is also about a mental health issue and also lacking the support of the system that are not fully uh, addressed uh, in, in the movements and also among the activists. Um, thirdly, that I, I um, would like to highlight is um, socio um, uh, socioeconomic impact um, that uh, women and other marginalized groups like, such as indigenous and, and, and other are facing and are not really well calculated or addressed it um, um, well in, in the movement. So um, I think um, to me, I, um, I think we, we all have, have different uh, uh, experience and also best practice uh, from different uh, country and other, and also we know that movements are, need to be united and, and other. But uh, okay. And perhaps we, we might have one minute. Okay. Yeah. Perhaps we might we might have different strategy. You know, like uh, capacity building and so on and so forth. You know, learning about the law. But but I think the question that we need to ask ourselves is that the process and also the interest. Are we really empowering uh, the ground and building the ownership, or and we are, are they really represent themselves or we as a civil society or you know ngo international ngo have been contribute to those a system without knowing that we also you know um saying that we are on behalf but no we are not on behalf they should be on their behalf they should be the one who fighting for it so i'm speaking today as one of the women who are, are also affected um from the patriarchy system but also as, as the sisterhood of the other women activists who are facing this and this have been not really um, addressing and, and it really invisible of gender inequality and uh, uh, not really speaking up uh, among the women um, with the government, you know, as a globally and we know that women are affected. Thank you, Raka, for that. Thank you, Reyesai. And finally, we have Farouk Tariq from Pakistan. Farooq is General Secretary of the Pakistan Kisan Rabita, or Peasants Coordination Committee. He is an alternate member of the International Coordination Committee of La Via Campesina, and a member of the International Organizing Committee of the Asia Europe People's Forum, so my organization. He has been involved in peasants and farmers movements since the 1970s. And he is our long-standing comrade in the AEPF Food Sovereignty Cluster, which organized this event. Uh, Farouk Bai. Thank you, uh, Raquel. Uh, this is a very unique uh, gathering where activists, peasant activists from Europe and Asian countries are sharing their experiences of how they are struggling and fighting for right to land and also the condition of their agriculture and the condition of the people who are working there. So welcome everyone who are listening to us, watching us on Facebook or on Twitter. Now I will take up the issue of Pakistan, which will also relate to some issues with India because conditions of peasantry in Pakistan and India are not much different. Now, there is a feudalism in Pakistan. Almost three-fourths of the total agriculture land is in the hand of 5% of those who have large land holdings. And also, agriculture, which is like 19% of the GDP, is been paralyzed by the policies and the new liberal agenda of the present government. 
Now, I will take up issue of the right to land because that is a basic right and Priscilla has very nicely explained the UN Peasant Charter approved in December 2018 uh, by presented by Lavia and that uh, Peasant Charter has been translated in Urdu and presented in several meetings in Pakistan either. This is a guiding document for most of the peasant organization in Europe and uh, in Asia particularly. Now, I will take up the issue of uh, how the land struggle in Pakistan has, uh, uh, has gone. Now, 72 years of independence, the land has been mainly in the hands of the feudals, there has been some attempts of land reforms, 59-72. In 72, it was better land reforms by Zulfkar Ali Bhutto, who was like a social democrat at the time. But this was undone by the dictatorship of General Ziaul Haq in the 80s, when he declared and some of the courts declared that land reforms are un-Islamic. And that is still the case in Pakistan that land forms are, are considered as uh, un-Islamic, as um, a right to any person to hold any uh, piece of land in Pakistan. And that the land which was given to the tenants, to the landless peasantry, to small farmers was taken back from them by these feudal lords. But it's not only the private landlords, it's the state landlord as well. One of them is military uh, of Pakistan. Now, military own quite a big uh, farm landing in Pakistan. And one of that is you know, Okada. Uh, and there was a, an effort by the military to kick these tenants who were working on those land which was like 68,000 acre of land in public sector in Punjab alone. And in 2000, uh, after General Zia dictatorship, General Musharraf dictatorship, military dictator took over, they tried that these tenants who had a hereditary right to the land should become lessee. They should work as contractors so they could throw them out. So these tenants rebelled. And they said, paid enough and no more. They have been paying half of the crop share to the military dictators, uh, which were not really the owners. It was the Punjab government who was the owner. But they said, these poor peasant told the military establishment, we are not going to pay you anything. And that's it. And this struggle since 2001 is still going on. Seventeen. Tenants have died with the firing. Over 16,000 tenants were charged. 4,000 police cases were registered. And one of our close friends who was supposed to speak instead of me over here, Mayor Abdul Star, was only released two weeks before after four and a half years of jail. And he was released by Lahore High Court. So tenants and the peasants were uh, facing state repression because they were demanding right to land. And this was not acceptable. And uh, these tenants of Okada has stood firm. And the main force behind these tenants were the women tenants who were in the forefront. And they have formed a sort of um, uh, a, a small force who could fight against uh, the police and the army whenever there was uh, an attack on the villages. These 19 villages since you now 20 years are not paying anything to the military establishment and they have become little better than what they had in the past. So the land rights struggle of Okara tenant has become like a very shining light for the activists throughout Pakistan. It has opened the way for the other organization to, to follow them. So in 2003, after they were isolated in Okara, their villages were 
encircled we had a big peasant conference and we in that peasant conference we formed pakistan kisan rabta committee since then it has brought together around 28 different peasant organization to a network to stand on land on right to land on food sovereignty on climate justice and these are the main issues we are fighting at present time in pakistan and we are also fighting for the equal rights of women peasants to the land because in pakistan women gets like one third instead of one half and that is another struggle which is going on in pakistan another issue is land grab there's a lot of land grabbing going on and a new city around lahore on the banks of the river ravi is been planned now which would throw out over 80000 peasants out of their land and they are not giving the proper compensation either we don't want any development which is at the cost of peasantry to leave their land we want agricultural land to be best used by the tenants and landless peasantry and the rural poor rather than for developing plazas hotels and so on and another by 1 minute 1 okay, minute last, last thing i would say on 3rd of november our peasants came to lahore to demand better prices for wheat police lathi charge them throw a chemical polluted water on them chemical is a war weapon which was used in lahore killing one person and then the police went against them and 187 peasants were charged many were arrested and no murder charge has been labeled against any police officer who have killed one peasants in lahore that struggle we are now at present time involved so i would say that the condition in india and pakistan where peasantry face lot of rep state repression lot of feudal repression lot of local admin pressure is not maybe the case in other countries but this is the fight that peasants have to fight together and united thank you thank you faruk bhai uh, we have now just about um 20 minutes left so my co-facilitator felix under from asian house will now take some questions from our q and a box and also um well also uh, receive maybe some some uh, comments and and feedback but um first the questions and 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 uh, the ones that we want to post to our panelists for their responses and the comments so felix take over yes I thank give you, you the floor thank you very much uh for all your brilliant inputs and thank you for the questions that we received so far um i'll put out um two or two and a half questions um that are slightly overarching that all of you can answer if you if you can or if you want to and then i'll also add uh one specific questions uh question to each of the speakers and please um keep your answers to about 3 minutes so uh, be selective and answer what you can uh so we'll we'll go through the round again in the same order so we'll start uh with kukudu um but my overarching questions and observations would be that um first of all we have a situation um in which land grabs really um are exacerbating and are, are taking place both in asia and in europe while maybe in europe it usually has a different name um but my question is how how can we prevent land grabs and how can we intervene into the situation of 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 land grabbings um maybe more overarching um one of the observations that i, I made throughout the uh great presentations is that there is maybe a slight um tension between the internationalism that we want to set up here um we're an internationalist uh, association after all and the very need for local specificity i think all of you have mentioned um that the the local specificity of the conflicts is very important and my question to you would be how can we still um collectivize our struggles 
and and bring that bring those struggles together. Um, I think that that remains an open question, and this is um, the very heart of this uh, webinar, of course. Um, one final question is um, for all of you that throughout history, I think there there was a um, a slightly problematic. Um, or uneasy relationship always between um, farmers, peasants, and labor. Um, and labor organizations and farmers organizations uh, sometimes worked together, together, sometimes didn't. Um, but now that, uh, based on, on, on your um, explanations of the current situation, I would hold that um, through the homogenization of agriculture, actually much of what we see in ag agriculture is now what we could call classical labor. Um, so based on that, um, we should probably think more strongly about how labor organizations and agricultural organizations can work together. Um, and my question to you would be, um, is that true in your context? And what could be the strategies to achieve that goal? Um, so you're welcome to talk to um, all, the, all those three topics. And I'll add one specific question to Kukuju. Um, namely that you were mentioning um, several opponents um, or several institutions that you have to work with, um, namely the military, the government and uh, private companies. And my question to you would be whether you, you need different strategies vis-a-vis um, -vis these actors and, and what others can learn from, from these strategies. Uh, first, uh, to respond to your question, that specific question about the strategy when we are dealing with the different powerful actors, including like government and business set aside. So, yes, I think like uh, uh, we there is a different strategy that dealing with, uh, but the one one main challenge for us is the as I mentioned mentioned in, in the pop uh, in the presentation that the existing laws land related laws are not fully protected to the farmers and so local community so uh, mostly if we go to the legal way that's like like 99 percent so that you are you are not suspect. so uh, so in, in, in this kinds of things, I directly walk and dealing and complain to the government. There is one way that people, uh, farmers are using, but it's not uh, uh, highlighting things. So uh, for the companies and then for others, like, uh, like more like plugging uh, protests, and then more posts on the action on the ground rather than going into the legal way. Because if, we, if the farmers and community goes the legal way, mostly that they lost. So that's a that's, that's short, short answer on that. So on the other side also, that's why that, uh, the activists and community are, uh, are, are trying to make a policy change. So that's one thing. And on the ground also, the dealing with day-to-day struggle are also happening. Yeah, that's one. And then for the, uh, for the net, the, the, the broad, broader question that you raised, I just would like to uh, mention the one point is like, uh, again, coming back again to the law and protect, because the, when we live in the country, the law is, uh, Anywhere that it's important that how it is proved that an impact to our life, uh, especially to the right to land. So uh, there is also the policy changing is happening by the same time government open up for the economic development. For example, at the moment in the country, national land law process is going on. So to that uh, to that point, like we are. We including like, uh, and also the farmers and other activists are working and posting their demands and their demands on the, that uh, national land law process also to become a federal land policy uh, to really like uh, bring uh, prosperities of the farmers and advisors. So it is, in, it is also good and important in futures that if we can uh, have more punishing and like, you know, to use to be able to 
how we say that to get more support and to work together and rise off uh, with the international community also that that will be also in benefiting some point I think yeah that's why. Thank you very much. Um, I got a message from Farouk that he would uh, like to speak to these questions too. Before that, I'll just uh, re-emphasize that um, all, of you, all of your questions are taken into account. Um, and Ulrike Bergman just wrote that she would find it interesting to come back to the question of land rights and right to land. I would have posed this question to Priscilla, but of course, all of you are welcome to, um, to issue your statements on that. And then we have another question on a uh, possible ban on uh, construction of housing societies. So if you have anything to say about that, uh, please do so. Uh, Farouk. I will take up uh, what you said in the beginning, uh, that uh, how to bring the local struggle in relation to the national and regional uh, basis. So that's what we did for this uh, Anjuman Muzari in Punjab uh, struggle in Okada district. Uh, when we heard, I wrote the first article. I sent it to all my friends, help the peasants. Because we knew if this struggle remains in Okada, it will be crushed. It has to go to Pakistan. It has to go in the region. It has to go internationally. So we brought uh, delegation after delegation to visit the lives of these tenants at Okada. So the police would stop these delegations. You can't go there. And then this would become a news itself. And those intellectuals, writers, poets, uh, activists, they will write themselves how they were treated by the military who refused entry for them to enter into the villages. And those who went into the villages, they saw themselves how bad condition they were living in. So we tried to bring the local struggle into the national struggle. And one very interesting incident, we started campaigning among the foreign journalists in Pakistan. And one of them was Washington Post correspondent who came to visit us in Lahore. And we told him the whole story. And fortunately or unfortunately, Musharraf dictator was to visit Washington and he was there. So he gave a very good briefing and so on. When he stopped, the first question came, what are you doing with the peasants in Okara? Musharraf was taken aback. What happened? How? I am hearing. He said, your military administration is trying to crush the struggle of the tenants. And then Musharraf was taken aback and he came back and he tried to be a bit more lenient and he asked not to go through that storm. So we pushed back the military offense through the help of our journalists as well. And writing articles were very important. We always wrote information. And that was important, maintaining our websites on Okada land rights and bringing it to Indian friends, to Sri Lankan friends, to Nepali friends, to everywhere that this is happening in Pakistan. Sometimes we get a response, sometimes we don't get a response. But you, you just... Uh, uh, but I would say, shout in the air, someone will listen. So that's what we did. We were always shouting in the air. Just one more thing which I'd like to say is the, is the briefly is the Labour and Farmers uh, uh, Alliance. And that is one of the must. When we are demanding better prices for the crops in Pakistan, how would a Labour buy expensive crops if his wages is too low. So we are linking a, a raise in the minimum wage of the workers and linking with that a raise in the price of the crops. So both goes together. And this has to be a very powerful link which we are trying to establish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farooq. Um, so we'll now um, hand over to Priscilla. Um, there is eager interest in discussing the question of right to land versus uh, land rights. Um, uh, Madhuresh Kumar has asked this and Sandeep um, as well. Um, so maybe you can say something about that beyond the overarching questions. Okay, uh, well, thank you. I'm, I'm happy that this uh, sparked some kind of debate. That was my intention. Uh, I just want to say that I don't have a, a very strong opinion about this. As a sociologist, I, I just tend to observe the terms that people use in which context and why. 
uh, and my overall assessment, but this would require more research, um, is that um, land rights seem to be used overall, certainly at the international level, by less progressive actors, um, you know, World, World Bank and the like, uh, while the right to land for me uh, has a stronger uh, human rights um, component and certainly emphasizes that um, we're talking about a human rights issue and directly uh, and I, I, I made that clear in my presentation also touches on the issue of whether we need to redistribute land, for example, or have a public debate. And this links to your question about land grabbing, whether we need to have a public debate about which uses of land we believe are uh, most useful uh, for society. Certainly in, in the context of Europe, um, we do have land grabbing, but we also have a lot of ongoing uh, transitions to other uses of the land to the extent that young farmers can't afford this land anymore and who will produce our food in 30, 50 years uh, with all this land being turned to uh, urban, uh, urban or, or industrial uses. So, um, so this was just, uh, some, some people also use the term rights to land and uh, I, think, I think that is also an interesting uh, term, which maybe uh, will be more satisfying for people who are worried that the right to land seems to emphasize the individual ownership. Uh, I would like to clarify, certainly, as I said also in my presentation, that this is certainly not the case. Um, it is both an individual and collective right, uh, and certainly not an, ab an absolute right. We're not also talking about um, collect um, absolute ownership. We're talking about the right to use land, the right to share land at different times of the year, uh, and I'm speaking here to conflicts, for example, between farmers and pastoralists uh, who both need to access land at different times, uh, etc. So we're certainly not talking about absolute uh, and individual property, but just making the link to the fact that uh, for some people, uh, it is essential to have access to land for their subsistence. Uh, I don't want to take the time from other speakers, and I know we have uh, very limited time. Just to the uh, question that you mentioned around the tension between the international dimension of these struggles and the need to be very context specific. Uh, for me, I see these two levels are as mutually reinforcing and not as, as being in tension. Uh, first, because international norms are not static, and this is what I showed also in my book, and I think that I try to explain also about the UN declaration on the rights of peasants is precisely this new international instrument is the outcome of grassroots people coming together and saying the human rights that we have now recognized by the UN do not reflect what we want and do not reflect what we need as tools for our struggles and we need these instruments to evolve to really resonate with our struggles and I think they did that very successfully with the right to land but also with the right to seeds and the right to food sovereignty so I think these norms evolve in response to what's going on at local struggles. But in the other way as well, we do have uh, increasingly local struggles being linked together, sharing the same strategies, uh, ex exchanging experiences and reinforcing each other as we're doing today. So I think uh, I would really see these as, a, as mutually reinforcing. And on the last point around labor, um, I think the IUF was a key uh, participant in the negotiations. And I think really uh, help make the, the uh, declaration inclusive of all rural constituencies. And I, as I mentioned, this is not a Via Campesina instrument and it is not a peasant rights instrument. It really also encompasses all these other rural constituencies. And I do think these alliances are key. Uh, and I think it's an, an important reminder for all actors in the food sovereignty movement to include uh, agricultural workers uh, issues more upfront. I will stop here, thank you. Thank you so much, Priscilla. Uh, I, I completely would agree with your analysis. Uh, it's, it's really uh, good points you're raising. Um, I'll hand over to Rodion now and add a um, specific question to you uh, raised by Sandeep Chatra, um, namely on uh, the potential conflicts uh, between movements that claim rights to land and the indigenous peoples who historically lived on, on that very land. Uh, maybe you can add something on that uh, beyond the overarching questions that I've raised already. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Felix, uh, and thanks for the uh, quite direct question. Uh, it's not so easy to 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 respond, uh, but uh, what I would like to say is that uh, we approach ourselves as a first nations. I mean, if we coming back to the colonial history. So that is uh, our position. 
And also we are right holders. We never approach ourselves as a stakeholders. So uh, that is our uh, principles. But also I have to say that our main targets uh, are extractive industries and the timber producers, which lead uh, uh, to negative impacts, particular land grabbing and deforestation. So in other cases, uh, we would like to create more alliances and partnership with peasants, with the farmers, with civil society organization. Otherwise, all of us, we will fail. So, uh, and of course, uh, uh, that is, uh, I mean, our principles and our uh, uh, strategy based on the, of course, on the different uh, situations. And finally, uh, uh, we also don't want to confront with uh, local communities um, because it's also uh, at different levels, including international levels, uh, uh, many approach us as the same. No, we are completely different. And also with regards to the uh, conservation and greens and geos, because we also we don't want to confront with, uh, with uh, conservation policy. But at the same time, uh, we, we are having a different agenda. So it's not so easy uh, uh, question, and so no, no easy answers. But to be very clear, uh, 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 that's why we are here to be part of uh, our joint uh, discussion and exchange to create more alliances and more partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Rodian. Um, Otila, you, you'll be next. Uh, I think there is plenty to discuss. Um, if you want, you can also say something on the new EU agricultural, uh, the common agricultural policy and how that affects your work. Um, but if, if you have enough to say, Regarding the other three questions, then please do that. Yeah, thank you. I will start with um, the question on labor because I find uh, we find it in Ecuador it's very interesting because while uh, looking in, in in our memberships and we see that when when land grabbing happens, especially uh, but not just but especially from the east uh, east of the the south of the country, we see that many of the people who are displaced, uh, whose lands are being taken away, uh, either abusively or they are forced to sell off, they become migrant workers for the Western European countries. And many of the migrant workers are coming, are, are peasants who are coming from, are displaced from their homes and from their lands. So we need to understand this relationship between uh, economic migration even inside the EU, in our case, as Romanians go going towards the West, and also the problems uh, generated by mainly Western, but also international investors in Eastern Europe by buying up a lot of land and creating concentration and by that displacing people. So, uh, of course, uh, that is my take also on to, what to, to build on what Priscilla was saying, that the IUF was very active in the uh, in, in, in making the declaration and, and reinforcing the declaration of peasants, uh, that it, indeed the problem of migration has to, uh, has to be taken up both on, a, on an international level uh, from the point of economic migration and what kind of problems do these people face at their homes, what made, makes them leave or how are they constrained to leave. And then uh, also we see this very much because Romania is one of the largest economic migrant country from the Europe. Uh, so that is a little bit just touching on migration. It's a very big, big uh, uh, debate anyway. Now, on, on, the, on the internationalist agenda, now we, we should also be thankful and to, to, to co communicate and collaborate in international movements like the Nyerani Food Something Movement, which is a global movement. And there's, uh, there are constituencies there from all, uh, all the movements that are present also here. And we should reinforce our international thinking uh, because we are all... Uh, rooting for the vision of and enforcing food sovereignty. Uh, so then um, also in our case, the Nyelani Europe and Central Asian Network, it's very important in order to bring together all the different struggles. And also in, in Via Campesina, we are working on an alert system for land struggles, for instance, so that we can quickly alert each other. For instance, a new land struggle has, has just be, begun in, uh, in uh, Switzerland. And this is very important to connect these struggles to, uh, to act as one. 
and and that that means we need to be better connected and that's one way of participating in international networks that uh, we can facilitate and then um what i want to say just uh, also let's not neglect that us peasants uh, are also not just working the land but we are forced or have to be also uh, uh, policy analysts and we need to we need to amend policy and we need to push for policy change uh, while we are seeking transformative changes in our current uh, 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 well, well, landscapes and in our countries and regions we also should uh, push for for uh, for land rights that are fair under the cu current policy uh, framework, and and Europe is a very hypocritical uh, actor in this place. So already since 2004, the European Union has created uh, what they call guidelines for ethical and and uh, and uh, inclusive land rights, and these guidelines were for developing countries and. And uh, just a few years after, grassroots society leading with TNI and ECDC were highlighting together that how much land grabbing and land concentration is in, inside the EU. And now we are reaching a peak point where the European Union's Parliament and Commission are recognizing that's a huge land problem in the European Union. Uh, so just like in any other parts of the world, and that we need to to fix this problem, not just to fix it, but to transform. That's what we are pushing. So, for instance, with Via Campesina in Europe, we are pushing for a new European land directive that is coming from the aspirations of peasants and that is coming uh, from the grassroots and with our knowledge and with our contribution. And this is a long, long lasting work that also needs to be done on a policy level while we reinforce each other also and we help each other on a grassroots level. So there you go, a, a farmer has to, a peasant has to be a policy uh, analyst, it has to work the land and it has to also evolve into all kinds of debates and networks. And our life is very complex and we are quite happy also about this because uh, we are sitting all together here and debating with it. So that that's uh, just quickly to mention the cap. The cap is, it was always, uh, it, it's an economic tool that is driving a lot land concentration and land grabbing, for instance, in Eastern Europe. It's a hard battle because always when the human rights context and the peasant rights context clashes with the economic uh, uh, problems and the economic policies, it's always a big debate about how, which to prevail. And now COVID is showing that we cannot go on just by proposing economic stimulants in order to fix something. We need to implement the, the tenure guidelines in Europe, we need to implement the Declaration of the Rights of Peasants, uh, and, and so on, so that we can, we can transform and adapt, rather than just to fix. So, thanks. Thank you so much, Artila. Uh, the, the speed with which you can speak also explains how you do all these tasks. Yes. Um, <laughs> I hope you sometimes sleep as well. Uh, it's very important <laughs> to get some rest, uh, but very impressive. Thank you so much. Um, and finally, um, you will have the last words, um, Zeng Riazai. Um, uh, you can respond to any of the questions that you want. And I think uh, what would be interesting as well is if you could also respond to the migration issue again, because that was very important in, in your talk and it came up again now uh, with Attila. So maybe you could um, make a final statement also on, on that question. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Felix. Um, one very quick, I, I think I would coming up from the, the questions of how we can bring labor and also the farmer or peasants movement together. Um, I think one good example of it is um, the parents of the, of the government worker are the patients and because of the struggle of their parents that's why they're sending them to work at the factory they're sending them to migrate and so on and so forth so i think to to end up this cycle of exploitations um, um it would be great to link in that way how it relates in in the way that we are coming from the same root we are coming from the same home but um, because of the system are forcing us to different struck goal and, and movement. So it would be great um, to highlight that. Um, and I, I think one, one of the things related to the question, how we bring the struggle together, um, the message of life is, um, land is life. It would be something that should be um, very, um, I agree with, with the, uh, uh, Pharaoh saying that um, we void through the air. You know, but but the air that we are watching out, the message. I think um, land is life. It, it would be something that need to be um, um, spreading out because people in 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 the 
in the era of the for industrialization, you know, and, and new economics model, people are saying that, you know, for those who have a property, who have a big land, you become a tycoon, you know, um, and people are saying that, no, and also a new technologies of, of, of growing some agricultural product. You don't need a land, you know, you just need um, a tube, you know, and you also can go without the land. And I think the idea is saying that you don't need a land to grow your agricultural product. It's something very dangerous to me um, because it's when people don't think that land is important anymore, but um, it's, it's a matter of land, you know, it's, it's a memory, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, so I think this is something that we can bring some goal together. But I, but I would also would like to see um, for those who are beyond our movements, um, who are in the middle class, you know, who are students, who are other, that they, they don't feel it late, you know, because they thought, no, I, I never experienced land grabbing, I never experienced, you know, putting in jail and so on and so forth. How we make them feel it late that um, sooner and later it is a system, everyone will be suffer from it, you know, and, and how can you leave one to another uh, to be struggled and, and you uh, claiming your privilege especially during the COVID-19. So I, I, I think this is something that uh, we can look at. Um, coming back to the, the, the issues of the migrations, um, I, I think it, it is a systematic issues that it's not just one country can be solved um, again, the same as the land issues. Uh, because um, many people are migrate right now, it's not migrate because different reason, a climate change migrations, a land gapping migrations, and you know, and, and none uh, for the different kind of ocean land gap, ocean gapping, it's, it's, it's a new term that we, we only seeing about the land, but right now ocean also gapping in some country. Um, so I think um, it's, it needs to be a systematic way of, of, of fighting. Um, I was thinking like we, at, at, at one of the hand, talking about um, uh, looking at working with how the policy can be changed, you know, can be amendments, you know, how can it be, be a citizen, uh, putting a citizen interest in the policy. I was thinking, how about we create our own policy? How about we create a people policies? And putting that as a negotiation with a policy maker and also other saying that if you don't, uh, if, if you, if you're only in the aircon, you know, have a privilege staying in, in the room with the aircon every time, you are not experiencing us as a farmer. Don't say that we are known, we have limited knowledge and so on and so forth. No, we are we're the one who experience it so well. I myself also have a privilege that we are working with us, but for those who are in the patients, they, they don't enjoy that, that kind of privilege. They, they work um, um, so hard, so, so it, it's good to, you know, to, to bring that experience and, uh, document those experience, those story, those struggle, and what they want to see to change in their life to become a policy. And then it goes. And if you don't know how to make a policy better for us, let us make a policy, and and you adopt it. I I don't know that it would be something possible, but I was thinking like, you know, try to try to explain something for those who are ignoring your issue or who never experienced putting the, their their foot at the map, uh, you know, or. In, in a very dirty land, you hardly to explain, you know, how struggle mm -hmm. you are. So let's us who are the, those struggle um, um, explaining you how difficult we are. So, yeah, so I think um, that that is something that um, we uh, need to be um, putting it forward. I don't know in yeah. what way, because in different contexts, but anyhow, uh, it is a systematic that need to be systematically uh, thinking and yes. And looking at, um, I think you, in the process of our movements, um, the, the most um, um, problem that I see many movement are fragile and from one to another, the, it's a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. what, what exactly the interest that we are fighting for? Are we fighting for only when I got a land, I don't need to fight for other in my own community, you know, something like that. Or are you have the common interest that you are not fighting for only your own land, but you're fighting for the whole community. Even you got the land, but either you don't got, you will stay, keep a stand for that. So um, building the commonality and building the power with power with um, a collective um, a bargaining and, and collective power, it would be something that can go again with the power over. 
that's how I always give me hope in, in that way. Yes. Thank you for that. You're right. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to all of the brilliant speakers. Um, it was really a joy and uh, it gives us a lot of hope to have all of you assemble, assemb assembled here and to talk about your struggles, but, but really in a way that, that connects them. And um, we from the Food Sovereignty Cluster in APF are very, very grateful uh, for your time. And also um, for those of you who joined us, uh, who watched and listened, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the support uh, with organizing the webinar, especially to the communications team, um, those who run the show in the background. Um, it's really important. And by now, we're, we're so good at it. We've done it uh, so many times. But um, without uh, Kathy and Vishnu in the background, uh, nothing of this would be possible. So thank you very much. And uh, also... Thanks a lot to um, Farouk Saleria, who, who did the amazing job at translating into Urdu. We all know how uh, quickly people speak when you only give them seven minutes. Um, so that's really a difficult task. Thank you so much uh, for, for helping us. And I'll give to Raquel for the final words of this webinar. Um, thanks very much, all of you. Okay, to make sure you don't miss our future events, you can register for the AEPF newsletter we do have on our website. Do support AEPF by visiting our website in our FB page, uh, Asia Europe People's Forum. And write us if you want to get involved in the Food Sovereignty Cluster. All of you participants here, do write us and we would happily introduce you to our uh, proceedings in our cluster and uh, also include you in our WhatsApp if you would like to be included. Thank you once again for joining us and see you all again in our coming events. And take care, everyone.